It's Eve Online 2020. Tuesday, May 19th. Let's see what's going on. Uh, I am Matterall, for those that don't know. I'm here with my friends, uh, Araya, Aria. Have we decided your name? Can we? Araya. <laughs> can we agree on your name? And uh, Shaquin, you, uh, if you hang out at TIS, you'll know who he is. He's usually quiet. Um, okay, so we're looking at, let's begin with uh, the EVE Online status monitor, looking at tranquility. And this is a neat little thing that you might notice every once in a while, once a month at least, and that is an extended downtime. And you can see that in the form of a gap. Let's see if I can zero in on it. There it is. So that's uh, from, well, for me last night, but depends on where you are in the world. But downtime is extended because there's usually a patch that comes through. We'll look and see what that patch was. This is not the big update. The big update is happening on the 26th. That's a week from today. Also on the 20th, you'll see a presentation from CCP on what the patch is going to entail what story line progress, what lore progress there is. And um, I have to say it's done very well. Uh, I can't talk about it in any specific terms or in any terms about the content, but I did come away feeling like I understood things better. So I encourage you guys to listen to that presentation that's coming from CCP. And then after that, we'll have on... The, one of the executive producers of EVE Online. Uh, and um, so that would be Berger. And we'll also have a marketing, uh, internal marketing guy, Goodfella. So he's familiar to everybody. Those two guys together on Talking In Stations, probably a week after the patch comes through because we want it to come through so they can actually talk about things. Because if they come in this weekend... They'll, uh, they'll have to uh, say no comment to a few things. All right, so let me go back to uh, this one trend that I wanted to look at, and that is, um, well, two trends, actually. One is we're getting a good population and good stability. I, mean, I love how flat that uh, player base is. Uh, and this is the PCU, remember, that's players concurrently playing. So that's how many people are online at one time. It takes account every minute, let's say. And um, whenever there is the most, that's the highest peak here. So right around um, 18 to 1900 UTC, that's basically European 6 p.m. You're always going to get the highest population. And then as it transitions later in a few hours later into American time zone, um, you see the combination of those two time zones coming together. And that's what creates the big, the high peak. It always has. U.S., European time zone uh, are usually when most players are in this game at the same time. And then as this cycle goes on, it gets later and later into U.S. time zone. And then um, eventually it'll get to the next day for some people in Australia... So they end up coming off of work at about 6 p.m. And that is usually what we used to call Australian time zone. So when we say it's U.S. time zone, European time zone, Australian time zone, this is 6 p.m. for them. So 6 p.m. Australian time is usually when the servers close. Um, so that's when you can, you can see pretty much the lowest population there. But before Australian time, now you have Russian time and you have Chinese time and now you have uh, North, sorry, uh, South Korean time. These are all, um, what did we call the time zone? It wasn't Chinese time zone, was it? I want to say there was a different name for it. But um, that is super filled out now. We talked about this before, but look how flat this is from... Um, 38,000 uh, down to 20,000 or 21,000. That is a fantastically consistent player base. It may not seem you like thinking it. you oceanic? I don't think that's what we call it. Um, there was a name that came out through the community, but I forget what it was. I think maybe I'm thinking of Winter Coalition because um, uh, that's such a neat name. 
I think there were different names for it. I've I've heard Eastern, I've heard Asian, the time zone. Asian, I think. Hi, Dutch Gunner. It's good to see you. Silva. Dude, Silva, you were in my dream for some reason. I don't know why. Like <laughs> And and I dreamt that you were really feisty about articles that you'd written. And that you were always like you were like clockwork. You always got your article in on time and and you were feisty about something, and I forget what it was. And, I, and then I woke up, and I'm like, does Silva even write? So it I must have been a dream. dream. <laughs> I'm not a good writer at all. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what the time zone's called, but what, what I'm pointing out, the one trend that I really like seeing these days is that it's relatively flat. Um, it's, I think it's flatter than I've ever seen EVE Online. And again, we can, if I can go, zoom in, even way back here in the height of 2013, which was like one of the heights of, wow, that's DDoS attacks there. Wow, that's more DDoS. I don't know why these drops are in there. There, you can see the, the curve back in 2012 was much different. Looks like some more gradual... Uh, that's a thicker U.S. EU time zone, but a, a longer drop here. See, it would go down to 16,000. So that's uh, that's 2015. Let's go back even further. What's wrong with this tranquility? It only goes as back, far back as 2012. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Yeah, it used to be a much deeper trough here, 21,000. So you'd have like 50,000 people playing, 49,000. And then it would go all the way down to like 22,000. Uh, it just feels a lot better now with more, with I think the Korean time zone. But here's another trend that is, to me, a little disturbing, or I don't understand what's going on here. And that is that if you look at the past week of new accounts signing in, uh, it seems to be going down from what looks like about 350 down 100 uh, subscribers per day, maybe. I don't know if that's per hour. Let's see. And then if you look at the past six months, it's been a, a lot more steady. Like there was a huge rush here on the f on beginning of the month, really. And then now by the uh, middle of the month, it looks like it's a lot lower. And trending lower too. Don't know what to make of that. But overall, well, yeah, it's, uh, what do you think it is? Places start to lift their to, place to start to lift their quarantine restrictions, or the weather gets better. Um, they're able to go outside more, so that might have something to do with it. Well, maybe it's new players joining. So yeah, I don't know. But if you look at the overall trend down here, the lifetime of tranquility, you can see uh, that. Uh, we're at one of the eras of new people playing this game that's higher than uh, it ever has been. Consistently, it's it's the highest it ever ever has been. And I've understood this from EVE Online too. What's happening with the population is, uh, I think that uh, this hopefully doesn't raise expectations because you never know what's going to happen. But I think this game is going to get very full in the next six months. Very full. Maybe as full as it has ever been. And if those players that are on are actually out doing stuff, it's going to feel like a, a more of a living environment. Okay. Hey, you guys have anything on the PCU or the numbers? Let's move on. Time to visit the kill boards. Well, not the kill boards. Let's look at the statistics for the most violent regions in EVE Online. Uh, you have, well, in Empire Space, which is going to change in a matter of days permanently, the Forge is at number one with 2,285 ships destroyed and nearly 1,000 pods. Number two is Lone Trek, 2,806. You notice that number, more ships have been destroyed in Lone Trek, but a lot less pods have been destroyed there, 344. Therefore, the Forge takes the lead. But uh, more ships were destroyed in Lone Track. And then Citadel comes in at just under 2,000, 1,968 ships destroyed, 420 pods. 
Empire Space isn't known for destroying pods because you get a standings hit. It's much worse than if you destroy them in outlaw space where nothing happens to you. But in in outlaw space, in the uh, zero, zero security area, uh, you have Veil of the Silent uh, coming in at first place with 682 ships destroyed. Essentially, Delve and Veil are tied. Delve takes number two at 688. So that's just six ships more than Veil. But I don't know why this is. More pods were destroyed. Uh, yeah, so Veil of the Silent had more pods destroyed. Same situation the Forge was in. Less ships destroyed in Veil. More pods destroyed in Veil. Together they equal the number one spot. But Delve is essentially tied. 688 ships destroyed. 464 pods destroyed. And then... Uh, Calavella Expanse right behind those two at 619 ships destroyed, 421 pods. The surprise here is Veil. Um, this Veil is Silent is an interesting region right now. It has a lot of different players in it, different groups. Uh, and uh, we'll have a look at the kill board uh, for Veil to see, see if there's any system in particular. And there is. So the most violent systems in 0-0 zero, zero, for the last 24 hours, in Veil of the Silent, VTAC O, J E N. 280 ships destroyed, 198 pods. And we'll go and look and see what's going on there. You also have what looks like a war over cache uh, or cache. And that's the second place region. And uh, so this system had 200. Sorry, this system is 2-TAC-2, two two, and it had 312 ships destroyed, 164 pods destroyed. And then also in Detrid, nearby, I think it's actually a neighbor, this system 1-K-A-W-TAC-T had 118 ships destroyed, 108. Let's look at these systems closely. First, we'll start with third position, 1-K-A-W. And it's actually on the border of Innsmother. And we do know that uh, there's some action going on in Insmother. There was a big battle there, I want to say, over the weekend. So that's probably in relation to that battle. We'll go ahead and uh, let's actually probe in and see what's going on here. So this area belongs to Unreal Alliance. And we're going to look and see who's actually doing the fighting in those areas. Here's the system, and in the last 24 hours, you see Pandemic Horde, a uh, bunch of pods. These guys, now, it looks like they got slaughtered, but really they're just uh, sacrificing their pods so they don't have to fly home. Yeah, but it looks like they brought out, uh, is that a destroyer? Yeah, Comorat. Yeah, it's a destroyer, T1 destroyer, super cheap ship. Uh... And it looks like they were roaming around just uh, picking locals off. Uh, it looks like Razor is hanging out there. Uh, Horde is... I'll have to find out who's actually fighting in Insmother because this is probably related to that. So that's what's going on in the number three spot. So the number two spot, and you can see again, on the border of Insmother between Wicked Creek, Insmother, and that is Detrid. Oh, I do want to check this out. I said that they were probably duplicate tab. There we go. I said Detroit is probably Cash's neighbor. Let's have a look and see if I was right about that. Uh, Detroit, yeah, Detroit is not Cash's neighbor. Uh, Inch Mother is Cash's neighbor, but <clears throat> you can see they're all related. Detroit's down here. Let me zoom in for you. It's in the southeast region of Eve Online, and it connects to Insmother, and Insmother connects to Cash, or Cash, however you want to pronounce it. And that is the outermost regions of Nullsec. That's as deep as you can get as far as the southeast is concerned. And the shallower parts that are closer to Empire Space would be Wicked Creek, Scalding Pass, and Great Wildlands. This tri-region of Great Wildlands Scalding Pass and Wicked Creek. Let's talk about that for a second. 
first of all, the Great Wildlands is almost completely uh, owned by NPCs. So nobody can really own Great Wildlands. It always was um, a hunting ground, basically, for Minmatar. At least in lore, it was. Um, if we look at sovereignty, it belongs to nobody. It's all Thucker tribe. That's T-H-U-K-K-E-R, in case I'm sound, saying it too fast, but Thucker tribe owns that uh, Great Wildlands area. It's very lawless. And it used to have only two stations or three. Here they are right here in uh, NDQ and e e e o 2 Those were stations that are pretty important because they were very few stations. Uh, so this was a great place to, to roam around. You weren't really supposed to live in this area. But since Citadels came around, that's changed the whole landscape of Great Wildlands. So it's almost like sleep in, swimming in the deep end without anything to grab onto if you start drowning. And now people have built little islands, so you can just go from citadel to citadel. So it's totally changed the landscape of Great Wildlands, but it used to be a much more of a roaming area and a place that nobody really could own. So right next to it, we go back to the universe, is Scalding Pass. And Scalding Pass is where a lot of groups go to get their beginning. And that is because it, it only has a little bit of good space. What we're looking at here, the purple and the blues, uh, the darker the color gets, the more dangerous that system is, but also the more fruitful it is, because the more dangerous it is in Nullsec, as far as NPCs go, the more loot you're going to get out of killing those NPCs. So blue and purple, and the darker it gets, the more desirable that space gets. So half the map is garbage space, as if you're just looking for loot and NPCs to kill. And this is why Scalding Pass was not desirable. So a lot of people, a lot of alliances, when they first wanted to get started, would go to certain regions of EVE Online to, to settle in, to get their foothold into null sec, to figure out if, you know, they could survive out here. And Scalding Pass was definitely one of those places. You also had places like Syndicate, Pravi, but Pravi was different in that it had people that lived there and protected it and uh, created their own environment there. Um, and there's a few other systems uh, that are out there that people just kind of move into originally to, to, to get their foothold. But Scalding Pass, to me, is probably the most, most traveled. It's also where people in transition go. Test Alliance, after the Fountain War, that they were defeated. And they went to Faction War, I think, for a few months. And they were just tiny. They had, I think, 30, 40 people in fleet. That's all they could get. But they moved to Scalding Pass and started to dominate that area because there were such small and de desperate little tribes there that they could kind of become the big boy on the block. And they built up, uh, maybe by engulfing some of those little alliances, they built up their player base to the point where it got uh, pretty big. And it was at this time that they saw Brave Alliance or Brave Collective moving into Catch. And so they joined Brave and formed the Hero Coalition. Um, but they had to rehabilitate themselves before they were even in a position to go. So at one time, living in Catch, you had the big, dominant, brave alliance, and you had the side alliance that was more experienced but had less people of Test Alliance. And it's funny how today that has totally flipped on its head. So now you have huge group called test with the small sidekick alliance brave so that's how things have changed going back to the map uh, wicked creek is another place that is similar it has a lot more even space so it's a little more desirable than scalding pass but it also has um it's also not super desirable because it doesn't have any really deep purple uh Areas, you know, you have this one constellation down here in one L tack uh, where you might get some good loot, but it's not going to give you that really, really high end stuff. So people don't uh, aspire to live in Wicked Creek either. But as you get further out to Detrid, you start to see better, richer space as it gets more dangerous. So the purple down here is desirable. And again, this is not, that's, that's along a pipe, which is not desirable. So the point is, if somebody 
if you're out in these systems that are nice and dark and purple at the bottom right here, you're going to be out there ratting and killing NPCs and getting good loot, but people are going to be flying through your system all the time because they have no option. It's on a pipe, so they have to fly through, which means you're going to get a lot of strangers coming and going through your system, and you're never going to know, are they here to kill me or are they just passing through? So it's a little more stressful than having a pocket that's isolated, like a cul-de-sac, you know. So that is uh, Detrid, and we're seeing people fight there. This is also where um, some more established groups will grow bigger and, and richer and that sort of thing. Uh, and then Innsmother has about the same. It has worse space, but also has better space. Uh, and that is worth fighting over, which is what's happening now. And then finally, Cache, again, which is solar fleets. Um, what is it? It's their traditional home. Why? Not because of the space, although it does have really nice little pockets, right? You see like three different areas or you can have a, a good amount of ratting, which means uh, a big group can have multiple areas for you to go and make money in. But it also sits right between two regions, two mega regions, right? You have the Southeast, which we just talked about, but you also have all of the drones right above it. So sitting in the center there allows you to foray into the northern parts of drone regions, sorry, the southern parts of drone regions, but you can foray north into the drone regions, or you can go south into the southeast regions. So you have good access to harass and fight other people. You have good money making since you have some deep blue and purple areas here. And then finally, it has a really nice jump. I won't be able to illustrate it. Let's see if I can illustrate it. <clears throat> has really nice jump into Great Wildlands and then right into Metropolis. So you can get into civilization pretty quick. So that is a desirable place to be. And Solar Fleet liked living there. Uh, they always wanted to conquer that and live there. Okay, bit off track. Let's go back to most violent systems. We were going to look at, so we went to Detroit and we also went to Catch. Let's investigate Catch and see what's going on there. Sorry, not catch, cache. I call it cache just so I can distinguish it from catch. Uh, and we will go here and see what's going on in this system. Again, pandemic horde uh, with Northern Coalition. It looks like Warped Intentions is working with them. If those are all the same fight, and they probably are, is colliding with Legacy and Vindictive. And I think this fight's over... The area, I think Vindictive lives there and uh, Pandafam or Horde and um, NC want to remove them. I think that's the thing. Let's look at related. Yeah, you have um, <clears throat> Evictus. Is it Evictus? I think it's Evictus. I called it, Vind and Vindictive's in there too, but I think it's Evictus. One of those two groups uh, lives there. And is it being attacked by basically Pandafam? Because you have Winter, you have Fraternity, Northern Coalition, Nelsechnia, Schulpin. Um, let me get this straight. I think Nelsechnia lives there. Let's go look. So we're talking about Cash. Let's look at who owns the spot now. Because somebody's being moved out, and there's definitely a collision of empires there. Yeah, you can see there's some systems that are not owned. These are in transition, probably. You can see uh, red halos or orange halos around some systems. That Those are ones being contested. So there's activity here, as we know. Uh, and ownership of half of it is no longer there. Most of it is this light blue, this kind of aqua blue, is uh, Nalsechnia. They're backed by Legacy, if I'm not mistaken. And I should be looking at chat in case you guys are filling me in. <laughs> Spod, Spod said, Thucker, please. <laughs> That's back from a great wild lens, the Thucker tribe. Uh, okay. Yeah, Nelsechnia owns half of it, but it looks like their hold is being broken up. Uh, I don't know who's being moved in. Let's see who this is. Stella Res 
Renaissance or Renescutor. Don't know who they are. XIX, are they moving in or out? Sorry, dot line is very slow. I don't know why it's doing that. Looks like they're moving out because they're vulnerable. Their infrastructure is vulnerable. So under attack. Yeah, Vindictive is part of Legacy. That's right. Uh, okay, so Evictus is too. I get those two groups confused. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, but I believe they're, they're being moved in. And NC Dodd and Pandafam is supporting the owners, Nilsecnia, in uh, cash. And I think that's what's going on there. So there is some activity there. You're going to see some tensions growing between uh, Legacy and uh, Pandafam. May not, it's not a, it's a proxy war, if anything. It's not a direct war. And finally, Veil of the Silent. So let's go up north. Check out that system. VTAC O J E N. VTAC O J E N. Uh, and we see deep water hooligans. Let's see if that's what the fight's about. Yeah, deep water hooligans. Oh, I see trigger happy in their fraternity. That's not what I'm looking for. Let's try that again. Here it is, uh, Brotherhood of Spacers. I recognize that logo, but that logo looks like the five or boss. <laughs> it looks like an old logo of old, an old alliance. Well, this region, Vale of the Silent, if we look at it on the map, has a lot of different groups living in it. Vale's up here right above the forge. It's good access to uh, Jita. So it's good access. It's also a huge region and also has some nice pockets. Now, when NC lived here, they, uh, they rented out a lot of those nice pockets. And so they would basically sit in a system waiting to, to kill anything that was moving around. And in, in this whole area, they would just rent it out to, to people who wanted to make money, including some of their own members that would have to pay rent for their uh, systems, but then they would be able to mine like crazy and build stuff and sell it all back to NC dot if it needed it. Uh, but if we look at um, the sovereignty, <clears throat> lots of different groups in here. Each color represents a different group, and you can see that they own a constellation or two. It's a very holistic, right? They're not they're not groups that hold on to like PL for instance or NC would hold one system because that was all they needed. There was one key system where everybody piled into. Uh, and that's where the military was. That was their staging. Um, but here you have groups that have essentially allowed each other to take over a whole constellation or two. So they're kind of living with in balance with one another, not interfering with each other's um, sovereignty claims. But they are fighting. Uh, and it's not good fights. It's not just for fun. They're fighting to survive there. It's really interesting to see. It's a little deliberate for my taste. Players had to come to the agreement to do this sort of thing because they all agree it's better for them, it's better for their members, it's better for the game in general. Um, <clears throat> but it's, but it, I wouldn't call it good fights uh, necessarily. You can see up here, as I was saying, that NC will own like a couple key systems and defend those systems, and it's basically their foothold into the area. So you can see these bright yellow systems here. Well, that's too bad. Let me try that again. On the right hand side here, no, didn't work. For some reason the zoom isn't working on the veil. Try that one last time. Nope, something's broken. But anyway, you can see the uh, yellow systems there. There's only two, that's NC dot. Yeah, I don't know why this dot line is borked right now. Sorry. So you have to look at the map in a small way here. So 
So that's what's going on in Veil, but let's look at where that system is. We'll get to it from here. VTech O. Yeah, this, this belongs to Deepwater Hooligans. That's why they were involved in that fight. Full broadside. That's hilarious. Uh, I like these guys' uh, branding. It's pretty good. You can see that big fight was about 12 hours ago, 400 people jumping into system. As far as ships that were destroyed there, so over 150. Those are nice-sized fights. Whenever you get a 400-person fight and... Uh, Basically like 200 on 200. Those are great sized fights. At least they were a long time ago. And they were optimal back then because they wouldn't crash the server, but there was enough people to have good action that lasted a long time. That may have changed now with the servers being a lot stronger than they were. But I always found that 200 versus 200 was very manageable and big enough to feel like you were doing something significant. So that was pretty good. Okay, before I go on, I'm gonna read a quick message here. Coming in from CCP, asking about some arrangements. And uh, let's go on here to The most violent systems in low sec will look for something that's different. And there is a little anomaly here. First of all, first position is Tama, 411 ships destroyed, 150 pods. And in third place, I'm gonna skip second place. Third place is Kana Kanaka and Black Rise. That's 150 ships destroyed, 36 pods. And that is very normal. But what's not normal is the number two spot. It's uh, asset. Uh, with one S, Asset, in Metropolis had 150 ships destroyed. So let's have a look at Asset. That is not a system we usually see, although Metropolis is a dangerous space. Uh, it's Empire space, but it's got a lot of low sec. So let's go look at that system and see what's going on. Ashra Khan. See if they're the ones. Yeah, Ashra Khan got into a fight. Ashra Khan is one of the oldest alliances in the game. Uh, let's see what they were fighting about. There we go. Let's widen that up. So, no, this is a small fight here. Only 13 ships and 8 ships. Uh, that doesn't look like big fight so let's go look again see if there's something else usually what i look for is a doctrine or some repetitive group of ships that usually tells me that there's something going on yeah so let's see Well, here's how we, we find out where the battle was, or maybe it's just a lot of activity. Uh, we'll go back to the statistics. We'll click on asset. We'll drill into the system itself and look for these graphs in the overview portion. There's different tabs. Okay, so this is why we can't find uh, a single battle because it looks like it's not a single battle. If you look at the jump rate, there's uh, hundreds of people coming in every few hours, uh, anywhere from 100 to... 200 people flying through. That's what those peaks are. So groups are traveling through. And it could be one group, or it could be multiple groups in an hour. You know, three groups of 30 will equal one of these spikes. So a lot of people passing through this system in Metropolis. This is low sec. Uh, and you also have ship kills. It's not one big spike. I mean, the biggest spike is only 20 ships destroyed at one time. But if you look at that consistency of five to 10 ships destroyed every hour, or every hour or two hours, that's going to add up over time to 136, I think it was, that were destroyed in the last 24 hours. So not a single point conflict. This looks like consistent activity going through asset in Metropolis. And if we want to picture that, we'll find it on the map to figure out where it is. And you can see that it is in a bunch of, let's go into sovereign to security. 
you can see it's kind of in the middle of a constellation here at the bottom right. I'll scoot in, see if we can get there, and we can't. Oh, well, there we go. You can see it's in the middle of a lot of low sec, so, and it's a choke point for many, not a choke point, but it's a bottleneck for a lot of systems. So this whole constellation has to run through asset. So that's why you're getting such uh, big numbers there. And it may be that that's a, a system where a new group is posted and decided to gate camp or uh, something new may have happened there. So we'll try to figure out um, what that is. Isn't it close to Flossuswin where there's this big ongoing tug of war between the uh, Minmatar and Amar faction warfare? Yes, it's right next to it. What a great point. Let's see. Faction war. Um, let's do ship kills in the last 24 hours. So we'll color it by ship kills. Yeah, Flossuswin is the second... No, down here in uh, is Bratata. These three systems, there's a lot going on there. So it's Faction War. We've talked about Flossuswin a lot. Let's see. I think I can get... Um, there is a setting here for... Um, Security, security class, stations, complexes, moon, minerals, jumps. I thought there was a, I think sovereignty will show. Yeah, it's Amar. It's been Matar space, but Amar has captured it. Okay, so I think Dotland is showing you the faction war identity of the place. So in Metropolis, you have uh, Amarians uh, who have captured that system. So yeah, it's basically faction war. That looks pretty good. You participate in Faction War Dutch? Um, I did it initially, but uh, after a while I realized that um, I just love being able to move around in high sec way too much. Mm -hmm. I try real hard to get as good as possible standings with the different navies, so it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to undo that work just for this type of content. <laughs> right. Okay, let's move on to uh, kills over 5 billion. Oh, yeah, sorry about that sound. It was my Slack notification. That's CCP. Uh, and I'm working out as uh, viewing for um, when we can arrange some CCPers to talk about the new patch coming out, either this weekend or next. Um, so we'll see. Look for the Sunday show, Talking in Stations. We'll have CCP. Top guys talking about what's coming and how to make sense of it. And uh, we hope to help with that. I think tomorrow we're going to see another, um, I'm just going to go trailer slash teaser. Oh. Um, I believe we're going to get a new scope news and that tends to be organized by CCP or at least it's, it's created by CCP mm -hmm. and it really covers things that have happened, things that are happening. And occasionally you can get hints on what is going to happen in the game in the near future. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely some, uh, if you are lost with the lore and, uh, can't make sense of it, don't know what's going on. You're trying to put everything into context. Um, CCP is going to do something to clarify that. They're going to give some information out, uh, to, to say, here's where we are now and here's how we got here. And that's going to be really good to kind of bring people into the fold to be able to understand the changes that are going to be hitting tranquility server. Yeah, and then thank you, Tiger. Tomorrow, CCP has the stream on invasions, and that is what I'm talking about. That's where they'll explain a lot of the backstory. Um, and that happens tomorrow. I don't know the time. You can find it on CCP's Twitter, um, but it is tomorrow on the 20th. So let's go to kills over 5 billion and see if we can find any anomalies in here. Uh, rogue mercenaries lost Tartara for eight billion. Um, who do we have here? Um, that's a that's a wormhole Fortizar that was destroyed. Um, there's a, a couple of uh, where they are. No, this, those are freighters being destroyed. Couple pods for five, six billion. Those are 
just probably plugins or implants on the things. I don't see anything here that is uh, jumping out at me. And I don't see any names that are jumping out at me too, or I can't speak to them, but you have uh, flying, you have Mechanicus Macabre uh, taken out by United Federation of Conifers. Watch out for Conifers. They're one of the top ranked alliances now, just in terms of space that they own. Um, and they're, <laughs> they look harmless. They look like air fresheners or little logo, but they're a um, pretty considerable group. So look out for them. Uh, and they took something out in decline. They might be cleaning up that area after a dead coalition. All right, it's not much going on there. Timer boards, we saw a lot of unspoken. Uh, they're coming out now in less than, where is this? Oh, I like that. Their ticker name is Quiet, Unspoken Alliance. And they're... Um, in tribute, so looks like they're under some pressure. Remember I told you, Vale, they had a lot of small alliances that were living there, um, more or less respecting the uh, the uh, consolidation of constellations by other groups. So they're kind of mini empires, uh, but looks like Unspoken is under a lot of pressure here because a lot of their infrastructure hubs are targeted for destruction. So we'll see if they can survive that. Okay, those are the stats for Tuesday, the 19th. And, uh, geez, what do we want to talk about today? The CSM candidates were announced, the official list. Uh, anybody have a link to that? I had one earlier. I'll find it. Yeah, this year we've got a um, total of 40 people who have been, um, who are now officially candidates. Part of the signing up for CSM, there was a pre-screening done by CCP. So we don't know how many people um, stepped forward, said, look, I want to be a candidate for the CSM. And we don't know how many um, didn't meet all the requirements that CCP posted beforehand. Like, these are our requirements. This is what we're looking for in order to um, complete your submission. And then we start screening. But at the end of the line, um, at the start of the campaigning period, there's 40 people running for CSM. Let's have a look at some of those. We can give you an official tally here. So Alex Finch from, in, from Brave Collective. Blazing Bunny from Northern Coalition. Uh, Bornell from Pandemic Horde. He is a, I am a hardcore Nelsec miner. And then he goes on to read his description. Brisk Rubal from The Initiative. Darius Caliente, I know that word. United Federation of Conifers. We were just talking about Conifers. And he is the longtime exec NFC for Conifers, it looks like. That's an interesting choice. I'm going to detour for a second because I want to check out Conifers. So let's go dot land. Go to uh, alliances tab. You'll see in the top 10 is at number nine, Federation of Conifers. And they have 615 members. That's what I wanted to check. How, how big a block does he have behind him or how, how many players? That is nothing compared to some of these other groups like Horde has 19,000. Goon Swarm has 29,000. Conifers has 615. So, not a huge block for Darius there, but yeah, I think they are very respected among other groups, so who knows? We'll see. And if you're well organized, you're well coordinated, you can take on much bigger groups and still come out on top. So, numbers, they help, but they're not everything. Right. Really, it's name recognition and whose imagination is sparked by your candidacy. So carrying on here is Duras from uh, the Classy Gentleman's Corporation. Dutch Gunner, I know that name, from Arataka Research Consortium. That would be you, right? 
Uh, yeah, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Exuki here from Dark Space Initiative. It used to be known as Scary Wormhole People. They moved in with the Initiative Mercenaries. So they're not actually in Initiative. Oh, yeah, it's the Initiative Mercenaries. I think initiative mercenaries is like the side group to initiative, but essentially they all fly together. So uh, you have Gobbins. He's the leader of pandemic horde. He's an incumbent running again, most likely to get on. Uh, Icarus Cassell is silent company. Now this person has a huge uh, group uh, playing. He was taught me. Okay. So that's, I don't know if he's the executor, but let's look at, I think if you look at m members, um, let's see. I guess they don't own space, so they're not on this list. But if I go ahead and look them up manually, yeah, they're a gigantic group in high sec. So they don't own space. They don't even own structures, but they are 23,000 people big. And these guys popped up on a radar when they were like half this size, and they just keep growing. So now it's... Uh, it's just a massive group. Um, most are in this one corporation, the Strategic Exploration and Development Corporation. And, and here he is, point of contacts, Icarus Cassell. So I imagine he is one of their key members, now running for CSM with a gigantic mailing list for votes uh, in high sec. So good luck. See if that works. It'll be the first time HiSec has put somebody in there solely based on the power of one single voting block. A nominate from Goon Swarm Federation is incumbent and running again. Insidious Saint Hood from Red versus Blue, that's um, a PvP arranged group uh, where two corporations go to war, uh, but he is a small gang FC. Iron Wolf from Evictus. We we're just talking about them. They're from Legacy as well. So um, it'll be interesting to see if Test and Brave get behind Iron Wolf to see if they put them on the ballot. This is January Valentine. Uh, that's an NPC corp that she belongs to. She's known for meta uh, stuff. She works with us on Talking In Stations. She's produced some of the shows that you've seen. <clears throat> She's also well known to people in the uh, media community. Jurious Doctor, also known in the media sphere, but he is part of Iron Guard in Nulsecnia Schulpen. Just Jurious Doctor. Some some a brilliant guy. He's almost too smart. Like I feel uh, inferior talking to him. So I have to think for a few seconds before I get his references and his jokes and stuff. He's a good good guy. He's also like seven feet tall. He's gigantic. Juventus uh, Draconius. He's from Goonswarm Federation in Requiem. They speak Spanish in Requiem. Uh, he works with TIS too. He's a moderator of our Spanish language channel. So we have three TIS people running for CSM so far. No, four, actually. Uh, forgot Izuki there. Uh, Talon Cerro. Uh, from Weeb Fleet. This guy, if, if you like Weeb stuff, he's one of the guys that started Weeb Fleet. And I think they have a giant Discord with just a lot of uh, Weeb stuff. And I think Weeb is a, supposed to be a derogatory name for like anime, I think. Uh, but he's totally embraced it. Doesn't matter to him. He's all about it. And he, I believe, was it Horde? I think he had to leave Horde because they just got tired of seeing all the anime. So they threw, threw them out or they basically left and started their own thing. Um, but he's run like four or five times now. Uh, good guy. Interesting. Kenneth Feld. This is a god of industry as far as I'm concerned. He's from Habitual Enthusiasm. That is the corporation that has been in Pandemic Legion for a long time. It's run by Elise Randolph from TIS. But Kenneth Feld is a big time industrialist. Uh, he, he builds, he builds big stuff, uh, and a lot of it. Comey Valentine, we talked about here on the show. Uh, she is an RP character from Germany. Well, the person that runs the 
Comey character is from Germany and is running for CIS, uh, CSM. Not for CIS. <laughs> and Comey is a interesting character in the in in that she is a what do they call it baseline. So this is somebody who is playing the game with a character that if you kill this character and pot it, the owner of that character uh, will destroy Comey. Will not let her spawn back uh, in a different body. That's baselining, which means you're playing in hard mode, which means death is death. Your character is gone. Everything you earned on it is gone. Uh, so that's a tough way to play EVE Online. It's a, it's, it's like a, it's a style. Few people do it, um, but it's definitely hard mode. It's the hardest mode you can play. You just basically delete your character once they get killed. And that's like a, that's a role play thing where you're, you're, uh, you're playing with a heightened uh, awareness of how, how much you can actually lose. The rest of us, we get to recover and we have our, all our assets, so we really don't feel death is the same way that he will. Okay, going on, Liam's uh, De Wildebeest, Blackwater USA. Recognize that group, Pandemic Horde. I think Blackwater used to be Mercenary Coalition, if I'm not mistaken. Laura Seco Cross. Hard Knocks. Uh, you've heard of Hard Knocks. Um, they are dominant group in wormholes. And Laura Seco is a clear spoken uh, member, I think, leadership. Uh, he and Braxis, I think, is the actual leader of Hard Knocks. And he is running probably on the wormhole candidate type platform. So you see a lot of support coming from that direction for him. Maria Taylor, uh, this is interesting, from Chaigua, that's fraternity. So Chaigua is the corporation, fraternity is the alliance. And uh, so this means probably that Naros uh, isn't going to run because he's a leader of fraternity. So their candidate is Maria Taylor. I think Maria ran before, but I'm not sure. fraternity did have a candidate and um i think that uh she it was a female if i'm not mistaken didn't do that well so we'll see if maria does better if it's not the same person i don't think it is meredith and thelis uh lipstad creed uh from slice solaris tonium i think that's slice am i wrong about that no that's slice that is slice right okay yeah Slice is a, was a big uh, alliance that was in Dead Coalition or Guardians of the Galaxies before they split off. And now I believe they're somewhere in the south. But uh, Meredith and Theolis. Uh, let's see. I exist for three things in the game. Lore, finding space rocks, that's mining, and being a Diplo. So now we're getting to the last few. This is Merkel Chen from... Karma Fleet. He's a leader of Karma Fleet. Uh, likeable guy. People like uh, the stuff he's done with Karma Fleet. And uh, from Goonswarm Federation. So Karma Fleet is a corporation in Goonswarm, the Alliance. He's also an incumbent, by the way. I think twice over. He's, yeah. I think he's on his, this would be his, I don't remember. Second or third year. Same with the uh, Anominate. Okay, so Mike Azariah from Scope. That's an NPC corporation. Uh, Mike Azariah has been on CSM before. He ran three or, f uh, I think, four or five times. He got on once or twice, and just an all-around great guy. If you meet him in person, he's terrific. Um, <clears throat> so he's known for um, helping out new players by handing out ships and getting them supplied and helping them to recover if they lose things and stuff like that. So he's dedicated his EVE Online to helping new players through the Magic School Bus organization, which goes around handing out ships to new players. Okay, Murray Rothbardo from Brand New Bros. I'm pretty sure not to be confused with Brand Newbies or the Newbie Collective. I think Brand New Bros is a different group. Um... Let's see. 
I'll have to make sure, but uh, Murray Rothbardo. I hope I got that right, but I'm pretty sure it's a different group than the brand newbies. Pandora Singularity from the Sixth Empire. If I'm not mistaken, that's Ivy, also from TIS. Uh, but she's popular socially I'm anyway. Right okay, I got to wrap it up. <laughs> and House of Singularity. Um, that's, I think, the one corporation inside the Empire. So Phantomite is from Snuff. And uh, I think he's no longer with Snuff. Now he's from Same Great Taste. PJ Hustle from Initiative Associates. I don't know. That's another member from Initiative. You had Brisk Rubal before that. Uh, Prospector Shiplock uh, from Goonswarm Federation. Ascendance, a big uh, group, big corporation there. Uh, Rhea Raynar, recognize uh, that name from Fuedit Free Range Chickens. Steadio, that's an FC from Horde, likely to get a lot of support. Stitch, he did great last year when he ran from Tuskers. Uh, so look out for Stitch. He is a real contender this year. I think he was really, he, he got a lot of votes. Storm Delay from Pandemic Horde. He's in the Vanguard, which is their elite forces. He's French, it looks like. Look for his support. Styx from Dark Shadow. Oz, who's also from TIS, and he is a trader. Um, by trader, I mean trades. And we talked to him, look for his episode a few episodes ago. And the last few here, Torvald Uras, um, Uruz, is um, Abyssal PvPer, great guy, streamer. UX Death, who is a legend of EVE Online. And uh, he was on a show recently. Just one second. And then finally, Vili. Oops, not finally. Vili from Test Alliance, uh, incumbent. And Zanuria from the Defense Union. That's an NPC Corp. He has been a CSM member before. Those are your candidates. And I am out of time, so we got to to get going. Let us know who you're going to vote for. If you want to, uh, type it into chat here. And good luck to all the candidates. Okay, that's all we have time for today. We will see you later. We are going to raid somebody. I will look it up in just a second. Bjorn B. Let's try that. Cheers, we'll see you tomorrow.